Kazakhstan continues to support the measures taken by the United Nations, the Arab League, United States, Russian Federation, Turkey, and the international community to bring the Syrian government and opposition forces together for dialogue and reconciliation. We particularly commend the unceasing efforts of Special Representative of the Secretary General, Mr. Stefan de Mistura, and appreciate the solidarity and unity exerted by the members of the Council in adopting unanimously Resolution 2336. All right, everyone, we're going to cut out of the UN Security Council and switch now to the Atlantic Council, where Samantha Power, the U.S. Ambassador to the UN, is speaking about U.S.-Russia relations. The reality is that for pivotal parts of our shared history, U.S. and Russian interests have frequently aligned. We fought together in both of the 20th century's world wars. Indeed, had it not been for the colossal sacrifices made by the Soviet Union in World War II, in which they lost more than 20 million people, many times more than any other nation, friend or foe. The war would have dragged on for much longer. Millions more Americans and people of other allied countries would have lost their lives, and fascism might well have prevailed in large parts of the world. Not to mention, that the post-World War II order may never have been built. Russia's immense contribution in that war is part of their proud history of standing up to imperialist powers, from the Mongols in the 16th century to Napoleon in the 19th century. In addition, many of the challenges that Russia faces today from violent... I know many of you guys are interested in hearing what Samantha Power has to say on U.S.-Russia relations. We'll get back to that later on today, but we want to take you now to the White House briefing room. We take you every day to Josh Ernest's daily briefing, and today is his final briefing. We want to bring you the historic moment live here on News Now. <laughs> Well, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't actually have any uh, announcements at the top, uh, but <laughs> but uh, but because today marks my last uh, briefing, uh, I hope you'll indulge me uh, a couple of personal thoughts uh, before I go to your questions. Um, as I prepared to stand here at this podium for the last time, I thought a lot about the first time. It was 16 years ago, this week. It was January 2001. I had just moved to Washington, D.C., and I got on a West Wing tour with a friend of a friend. We walked through the halls of the West Wing on that tour. We saw tired White House staffers lugging boxes of their personal belongings out of the building, uh, much the way that people who are on West Wing tours today see. And on the tour, I smiled for a photo that a friend took of me 
standing behind this very podium. I had been in DC for a grand total of two weeks. I had no contacts. I had no job prospects. I had no relevant Washington experience. I was sleeping on the floor of a college buddy's apartment that had a spare bedroom. And by spare, I don't just mean it was an extra bedroom. It was an empty bedroom containing only the items that I'd managed to load into my car when I moved here from Texas. So it's fair to say that there weren't too many other people on the tour that night who thought I would stand here in front of you as something other than a tourist. So it's been an extraordinary journey, and this has been an extraordinary chapter. This is the 354th White House daily briefing that I have led as the press secretary. Mark can check me on that number. Uh, not every briefing started exactly on time. Um, there might have been a briefing or two that went a little longer than you would have preferred. Uh, but you have to admit, there was a lot to discuss. We had plenty of uh, shameless plugs for the Kansas City Royals to squeeze in. Uh, there was, of course, the Freedom Caucus's infamous Tortilla Coast gambit. Uh, there was Congressman Steve Scalise, who reportedly compared himself favorably to David Duke. Uh, there was the reintroduction of the word snafu into the political lexicon as we were working to pass TPA. We discussed at length the various ways you can catch Zika, uh, the various ways you can catch Ebola, uh, and the various reasons scientists recommend you vaccinate your kids so that you don't catch the measles. John Stewart lit me up as I struggled to explain to John Carl why a couple of our political ambassadors for some reason had no idea what they were doing. Um, at least uh, the Stewart segment made some of my friends laugh. Uh, President-elect Trump, of course, uh, took advantage of the opportunity to light me up as a foolish guy who makes even the good news sound bad. Uh, and I have to admit that even that one made me laugh. But it wasn't always fun and games around here. There was the time that I ta tangled with Senator Schumer about DHS funding for New York City, and the time that I tangled with Senator Schumer over the Iran deal, <laughs> and the time that I tangled with Senator Schumer over the JASTA legislation, and the time I tangled with Senator Schumer over the wisdom of passing Obamacare, and the time I tangled with Senator Schumer over Trade Promotion Authority legislation, and to think, we actually spent most of the last two and a half years complaining about how unreasonable Republicans in Congress are. The daily briefing, of course, is the most high profile part of the press secretary's job, but it's not the only part that matters. The more important part, in many ways, is working with all of you and ensuring that the freedom of the press, uh, and ensuring the freedom of the press that keeps this democracy vital. When I first entered this role, I worked closely with the White House Travel Office and the Department of Defense to reform the billing process for your flights and military aircraft including Air Force One, making those bills more transparent and smaller. In the last two and a half years, we've cajoled governments in China, Ethiopia, and Cuba to host news conferences on their soil, allowing the leaders of those countries and their citizens to see firsthand what it means for independent journalists to hold those in power accountable. Of course, it was the end of the year news conference that the President convened in this room in 2014 that got as much attention as any other because President Obama called on eight journalists, all women. And finally, everything that, uh, about this final week uh, makes me think of all the incredible people uh, whom I've been blessed to work with these past eight years. I only have this opportunity because Robert Gibbs pulled me aside on election night 2008 in Chicago as the returns were coming in to tell me that he wanted me to come uh, work with him at the White House. I'm only here because Jay Carney, Jennifer Palmieri, and Dan Pfeiffer supported and encouraged me when I was the deputy and advocated for me when Jay stepped down. I've also benefited from a kitchen cabinet of senior White House officials who've got a lot of other important responsibilities who are part of their formal job description, but uh, stepped in to help me out every time I asked for it. Uh, that's people like Dennis McDonough and Susan Rice and Jennifer Saki, Liz Allen, Jesse Lee, Cody Keenan, and uh, of course, Ben Rhodes. And I've only been able to do this job because I have an incredible team around me. My assistants over the years, Jeff Tiller, Antoinette Rangel, and now Desiree Barnes, all patiently supported a guy who, let's face it, sometimes isn't so easy to assist. Uh, the White House stenographers, uh, Dominique dansky berry uh, Beck Dory Stein, Amy Sands, Mike McCormick, Caitlin Young, and their tireless leader, Peggy Suntum, uh, they work as hard as anybody at the White House and complain about it less than anybody at the White House. Uh, applause is appropriate at that point. Um, 
I think the only team that may contend with him might be the research department here at the White House that's led by uh, Alex Plotkin and Kristen Bartoloni. Um, uh, but I hope you'll get a chance uh, over the course of the next week to thank the stenographers for their important work, because I know uh, they make your lives a lot easier, too. Uh, the same goes for uh, Peter Vells, Brian Gabriel, and, and Sarah Rutherford, who are stretched as thin and who are at least as effective as any team of press wranglers we've ever had here at the White House. My colleagues at the NSC, including Ned Price, Emily Horn, Mark Stroh, Carl Woog, and Du Tiantawat, have patiently explained to me the things that I didn't know so that I could in turn explain them to you. Uh, my team in lower press, uh, Patrick Roddenbush, Katie Hill, and Brandy Hoffine, is as talented and as dedicated as any press team in this town. I begged Brandy to join this team uh, when I first got this job, and her performance has far exceeded the sky-high recommendations I got from people all over town after I interviewed her. Uh, they are all, Katie, Brandy, and Patrick, as they say, going places. Uh, Eric Schultz is simply the best deputy that anyone in any field could ask for. He shows up early, he stays late, he's deft. That's an inside joke. Um, he's always prepared, he's unfailingly loyal. His judgment is sought after throughout the halls of the White House, not just by me, uh, but by various members of the senior staff. And I'm sure that will be sought after in his bright post-White House future too, including by me. When you're President of the United States, and widely regarded as among the most thoughtful and eloquent speakers on the planet, it must be hard to watch someone go on TV and speak for you. I suspect that's why when the President offered me this job, he said he wouldn't watch my briefings. Uh, but I know that he saw parts of them on those very rare occasions that he watched cable TV. And he never second-guessed me, not once. He didn't just give me the opportunity of a lifetime, he had my back every single day and I'm grateful for it. But there is one person who contributed to my success more than anyone else, and she doesn't even work at the White House. My wife, Natalie, was six months pregnant with our first child when I got this job. She was home with the air conditioning repairman when the President of the United States called me into the Oval Office to offer me the job. When I got back to my desk, I saw that I had several missed calls on my cell phone from her. I quickly called her back. I told her that I was sorry that I missed her calls, but that I had the best possible excuse for missing them. Since then, she's extended to me more support and understanding than I could ever ask for, even as she was becoming the best mom any two-year-old kid could hope for. When I missed the mark up here, she didn't hesitate to tell me about it. And when I got it right the next day, it was usually because I followed her advice. So thank you, sweetheart, for your patience, your loyalty, your counsel, and your love. Without it, I would not be standing here, and I'll never be able to make it up to you, uh, but I look forward to spending some more time with you in Walker so that I can give it a shot. Serving as the White House Press Secretary under President Obama has been an incredible honor. I've had the opportunity to advocate for his vision of the country, the same vision that deeply resonated with me when I signed up to work for him in Iowa in March 2007. And while those of us who have been fortunate enough to serve him here will go on to make a difference in new ways, I take heart in knowing that all of you will still be here. I draw confidence in knowing that you are driven by the same spirit that prompted those young kids that I mentioned at the top of my briefing a couple of weeks ago to move to an Iowa town that they'd never heard of to organize support for the Obama campaign. You have the same determination as the young people who are moving to Washington, D.C. today with no job, with no contacts, and no prospects who are hoping to work in the Trump administration. You're motivated in the same way as the career civil servants, uh, like the ones at the Department of Education who's trying to stretch her agency's budget to ensure as many Hispanic kids as possible can get a decent education. You have so much in common with these people because each of you and what you do every day is critical to the success of our democracy. There will be days when you'll show up to work tired. I know the same was true of those Obama organizers in Iowa. There will be days where you will feel disrespected. And I know many of the young Republican staffers who moved to Washington looking for a job will feel that way at times. It's hard to pound the pavement in this town when you don't know anybody. There'll be days where, you'll, where you will wonder if what you're doing even makes a difference. And I know that our civil servants sometimes wonder the same thing. But I assure you, if you, the most talented, experienced, effective press corps in the world, didn't play your part in our democracy, we would all notice. Your passion for your work and its centrality to the success of our democracy is a uniquely American feature of our government. It's made President Obama a better, a better president and a better public servant. And it's because you persevere and you never go easy on us. 
So even though it's my last day, you better not let up now. So uh, in that spirit, let me say for the, uh, the last time standing up here, Josh, you want to get started with questions? Sure. Thanks, Josh. I, uh, I, I am, I'm not interrupting because he was saying nice things about you guys, uh, because I largely concur. Uh, when I first met Josh Ernest, uh, he was in Iowa. Uh, I think he was wearing jeans. He looked even younger than he was. Uh, and since my entire campaign depended on communications in Iowa, um, I gave him a, a pretty good uh, uh, once over. And there are a couple things I learned about him right away. Uh, number one, you know, he, he's just got that all-American matinee good-looking thing going. <laughs> That's helpful, let's face it. Face made for television. Then the guy's name is Josh Ernest, <laughs> which if somebody's speaking on your behalf, uh, is a pretty good name to have. Uh, but what struck me most, in addition to his smarts and his maturity and his actual interest in the issues, um, was his integrity. You know, there are people you meet who you have a pretty good inkling right off the bat are straight shooters and were raised to be fundamentally honest uh, and to treat people with respect. And there are times where that first impression turns out to be wrong and you're a little disappointed and you see uh, behind the curtain that there's spin and uh, some uh, hype and you know, posturing going on. But then there's others who, the longer you know them, the better you know them, uh, the more time you spend with them, the more you're tested under tough situations, uh, the more that initial impression is confirmed. Uh, and I have now known this guy for 10 years almost. And I've watched him grow, and I've watched him advance, and I've watched him marry, and I've watched him be a father, and I've watched him manage younger people coming up behind him. And he's never disappointed. He has always been the guy you wanted him to be. Um, and I think that, you know, you, if you're the President of the United States and you find out that this is the guy who has been voted the most popular press secretary ever by the White House press corps, that may make you a little nervous, <laughs> thinking, well, maybe the guy's kind of uh, you know, being too uh, solicitous towards, uh, towards the press. But the fact is, is that he was worthy of that admiration. Um, he was tough, and he didn't always give you guys everything you wanted, but he was always prepared. He was always courteous. He always tried to make sure that uh, he could share with you as much of our thinking and our policy and our uh, vision as possible and tried to be as responsive as possible, and that's how he trained uh, the rest of his team to be. Um, so, uh, you know, of, of, of the folks that I've had the great joy and pleasure of working with over the last 10 years uh, on this incredible journey, um, you know, this guy ranks as high as uh, just about anybody I've worked with. Uh, he is not only a great pre press secretary, but more importantly, uh, he is a really, really good man, uh, and I'm really, really proud of him. So, Josh, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
And Natalie and uh, Walker, thanks for putting up with uh, all of this because because uh, they've made sacrifices too. Thank you, sir. Before you go, response to Vladimir Putin. I'm going to be <laughs> <laughs> Where were you going on Friday? <laughs> uh, well, that was awfully generous. Um, so uh, th the president will be back uh, tomorrow. Uh, he'll be standing here and uh, he'll be answering your questions. Uh, today you're going to have to settle for me. So, uh, Josh, you want to get us started? Sure. Thanks, Josh. And uh, I want to thank you and your team for your hard work and, and service in your roles. Uh, we've all uh, tussled aggressively with you over the last many years, but that was as it should be, and uh, you all have continued to always engage with us, and we appreciated that. Um, Thank you, John. Following up on the question that was just asked, have the Obamas decided where they will be heading when they board the presidential aircraft for the final time on Friday? Yes. Uh, Josh, I can tell you that the, uh, that the first family is looking forward to uh, flying to Palm Springs, California uh, on Friday. Uh, the President vowed to take his family to a destination that is warmer than Washington, D.C. Uh, on Friday, and uh, Palm Springs fits the bill. This is a, uh, a community that the President's visited on a number of occasions as President of the United States. Uh, he and his family uh, have enjoyed this, the time they spent there in the past, uh, and they're looking to travel there on Friday, looking forward to traveling there on Friday. And President Putin today uh, was accusing the Obama administration of spreading false information about the president-elect in an attempt to uh, delegitimize his presidency and said that those in this administration who did that were worse than prostitutes. Uh, does the Obama administration have any comment on that? Yeah, that's an interesting metaphor that he chose there. Um, that, listen, I, as I've said on a number of occasions, the men and women of the United States intelligence community are patriots. They are experts in their field. They do their work not because of the glory associated with it, because most of the time they have to keep their names secret. They don't do it for the big pay, because in many situations they could make a whole lot more money in the private sector. They do their important work to keep our country safe because they love this country. And they have served us incredibly well in keeping us safe. They have served President Obama enormously well. Uh, and. This is not the first time that uh, the intelligence community has had some uncomfortable things to say about Russia. These are the kinds of things that I'm sure the Russians would rather not hear. But ultimately, and this is something that the next administration is going to have to decide, there's a pretty stark divide here. On one side, you've got the men and women of the United States intelligence community. You've got Democrats in Congress. You've got Republicans in Congress who are concerned deeply about the way that the Russian apparatus sought to call into question the legitimacy and stability of our democracy. On the other side, You've got WikiLeaks and the Russians. And the uh, incoming administration is going to have to decide which side they're going to come down on. And um, it will be among the very interesting things that all of you will be closely watching in the next week. I was wondering, as you were reflecting over the last eight years, whether you can identify uh, the greatest achievement that you felt you were able to accomplish and also the uh, biggest regret that you have as you're leaving this part of your life? Well, I, um, I, I think there are two things that come to mind. The, the first is that over the course of the eight years that I've worked here in the White House, the President's communication team walked in this building at a time of dramatic change in the media environment, in the news business thanks largely to advancements in technology. And updating and modernizing and capitalizing on those new opportunities was an important part of President Obama's success in the White House. I, I, I cite this example because I think it's a good one, as you all consider the relationship that you're going to build with the incoming administration. It's a good example because some of the things that we've heard from the incoming administration has uh, raised some concerns, at least based on what I've read publicly. 
some of the things that we tried to do. Capitalizing on new technology, breaking news on Twitter, having the president film videos that we released on Facebook, doing, having the president engage in conversations that were released to the public with people who aren't journalists, but people who have a strong following nonetheless, whether that's somebody like Mark Maron uh, or any of the uh, YouTube personalities that President Obama has an opportunity to visit with. Bear Grylls in this category. That, all of that was disconcerting uh, to people in this room and was the source of some friction between our operations. But those changes were beneficial to the American people and to this president and to this White House. Because in a changing environment, we need to capitalize on every available opportunity to make sure that the president's voice and his message is heard. And, um, and those were good opportunities to do that. So my hope is that as you all navigate the, this new relationship, that you'll protect the things that are worth protecting. Protecting this daily briefing and the regular exchange that senior officials have at the White House with all of you to answer tough questions, to be held accountable, to re respond to calls for greater transparency. It's uncomfortable to be in a position of authority, certainly in a position of responsibility, and to be subjected to those kinds of questions. That's true even when you're doing the right thing, for the right reasons. But it's a necessary part of our democracy. And so my hope is that that, that the essence of this relationship between the White House press corps and the White House press office will be preserved and it will be maintained uh, for future generations to benefit from. But there also is a good reason not just to, there's also a good reason to not just raise objections because uh, proposed changes depart from the way we've been doing things for a long time. The fact that uh, we've been doing something the same way for a long time is not in and of itself a good reason to keep doing things the same way. So uh, this is gonna require um, a lot of hard work. It's probably going to retire, require building some trust. Uh, but I'm optimistic that the White House press corps and the White House press office can continue to adapt to the uh, modern environment, even as some of the basics and the, uh, this important principle uh, continues to be protected. Um, and I feel like we've navigated that pretty well. Uh, and that certainly was uh, an important part of my responsibilities here, both in my first uh, five and a half years as the Deputy White House Press Secretary and certainly in the last two and a half as the, uh, as the Press Secretary.